welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to be fitting a new motherboard and processor in an old desktop PC. Specifically, I'm going to be fitting this ASRock H410 chipset motherboard and this Pentium Gold microprocessor, as these are the best low-cost components I could purchase in the spring of 2021. So, let's go and get started. Right, here we are back with the old PC I've been upgrading in previous videos, and which currently has a Pentium E5500 processor in this Gigabyte motherboard, and it's got 8 gigabytes of RAM. However, the RAM here is DDR3, so we can't use that in a new motherboard, so what we're going to be doing is replacing the PC's processor, motherboard and memory. And before we do this, there are a few things which are worth noting. Firstly, some of you have asked whether fitting a new motherboard and a CPU in a PC is actually building a new computer rather than doing an upgrade, and this could be argued either way. But as what we call things that are relevant to the process, I'm simply going to rapidly move on. Secondly, if you want to put a new motherboard in an old PC, it needs to have an appropriate case and power supply. Here, the existing motherboard has got a micro ATX form factor, which means it's 244mm long on the back connector edge, rather than being 305mm long here for a full-size ATX form factor motherboard. So our new motherboard obviously needs to be micro ATX or smaller, or it won't fit in this case. This said, it's worth noting if you have a case which has currently got a full-size ATX motherboard, 305mm down here, you could put a micro ATX motherboard in that case that would be the mountings to allow you to do that. We should additionally note that this case has got a cutout in the back to take an ATX input-output or I.O. shield. This PC is also fitted with a power supply which connects via a 24-pin ATX connector as well as an additional 4-pin 12-volt connector. And this means that the power supply here will work with a modern PC motherboard. For comparison, if we look inside this much older old PC, we can see that the case doesn't have an ATX I.O. shield on the back, and so it cannot accommodate modern motherboard connectors. We can also see that the power supply here doesn't connect via a 24-pin ATX connector, and it also doesn't have an additional 12-volt connector to plug into the motherboard. And so it wouldn't be easily possible to fit a modern motherboard into this old PC. It's also worth noting that older PCs from some manufacturers, and most notably Dell, sometimes don't have standard motherboard mountings or standard ATX power connectors. So do be very careful indeed if you want to change the motherboard in an old Dell PC. Returning to the PC we're upgrading, the power supply is rated at 355 watts, which will be fine for the components we're going to be fitting, although if we wanted to add a separate graphics card, we should have a higher rated power supply. This said, I'm sure that already there are people in the comments saying that I should be fitting a new power supply anyway. I shouldn't be using this old power supply. And there is an argument for that, because old power supplies can fail. This said, it could also be argued I should be using a new case and also new drives. And so it all comes down to how much you want to spend and how much e-waste you're prepared to produce. Here, we're fitting a new motherboard, CPU and RAM, which will cost £162.21. And we're reusing the existing case, the power supply, the case fan and the drives. And to buy a new entry-level case and power supply and comparable drives would cost somewhere between at least 100 and 130 pounds, so adding up to 50% of the total cost. Hence, as my goal here is to demonstrate the lowest cost new component upgrade, which will give this old PC a modern specification, I'm going to be keeping the existing power supply. A final thing to mention is that most PCs have a system builder or OEM version of Windows that is licensed to the original motherboard only. So in theory, if you fit a new motherboard, you need to purchase a new Windows license. Now, in practice, if before you upgrade, you link a PC's copy of Windows 10 to a Microsoft account, then after the upgrade, you may well be able to reactivate Windows using the activation troubleshooter. However, this is not guaranteed, especially on older PCs where Windows was pre-installed. 
And of course, you may not want to link your Windows license to a Microsoft account. So please be aware that if you upgrade your motherboard, you may need to buy a new license key if you want to reactivate Windows. Right, here we have our new components, which as I've already noted, cost me £162.21, which is about $225. And this was significantly more than I expected to pay for these entry-level parts. But in the spring of 2021, hardware prices remain high due to increased demand and supply shortages. You could, of course, select other parts in an upgrade you might be doing yourself, a higher specification, motherboard, processor memory, etc. And indeed, my initial plan for this upgrade was to use an AMD Athlon 3000G processor but in over two months I couldn't get hold of one, and so I've decided to go with the, this Intel Pentium Gold. Specifically, what we have here is a Pentium G6400, which is a dual-core CPU with a 4 GHz base frequency and Intel UHD 610 graphics. Launched in April 2020, the G6400 uses Intel's latest desktop LGA1200 socket and requires a motherboard with an Intel 400 series chipset. In March 2021, this cost me £62.38 and was listed on Amazon.com for $69.99. We can see the chip itself through the top of the box, sort of looking out there being rather happy, so let's get it out. Let's bring in Stanley the knife and uh, cut things open down here, I think, like that. Always exciting opening a new processor. And the biggest part here will be the cooler. There we are, there's a processor on the top. Uh, can we get that out? There we are, there's the processor in its little uh, packet. And this is the cooler, which is supplied with it, which is, which is good. How do we open the cooler? Do this carefully, because there will be some thermal compound already applied. There we are, we can see thermal compound on the cooler there. And if we just lift it out carefully, not touching the thermal compound, there is the uh, Intel stock cooler for our processor, which I'll, I'll leave carefully packed away in the box. Next, we have our motherboard, which is this ASRock H410M HVS Revision 2. What an exciting name for a motherboard. And this cost me £56.99, which is about $70. So let's open it up, nice and straightforward like that. Oh, we've got our IO shield waiting in the top to go in the back of the case. Some SATA cables. We've got a manual, which, oh, the manual's also got a driver DVD. We don't always get those these days, but the star of the show is under this piece of cardboard. There it is. There's our new motherboard. Always exciting to have a new motherboard. Let's just get rid of that down there. And if we get this out, oh, crinkle, crinkle out of the material. There we are. Here is our new motherboard. I do like opening up new processors and motherboards and components and well, everything to do with computers, really. They're always very exciting. So let's just bring you in a little bit closer so we can take a better look at the board. And in the center, we have got the socket. This is the LGA 1200 socket. And this board is equipped, as its name suggests, with an Intel 410 chipset, which means it's compatible with our Pentium G6400. The 410 chipset is the lowest specification 400 series chipset available, and this really is an entry-level board but we still get two DDR4 DIMM slots supporting up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. And then on the back edge, we find a VGA port supporting a resolution of up to 1920 by 1200 at 60 frames a second and an HDMI connector supporting 4K at 30 frames a second. We then find along from these a PS2 keyboard and mouse port. We've got four USB 2 ports, two USB 3 ports, a gigabit ethernet, and 3.5 millimeter audio connectors. Back on the top of the board, we find two PCIe 3.0 slots, a times 16 slot where you can put in a graphics card and a times one slot. And down here, we've got four SATA 3 ports for connecting in drives. Then we've also got the usual headers you would expect, including the front header here for two USB 3 ports. And in fact, the only thing we don't get on this entry level board is an M.2 slot. So you can't use an M.2 NVMe SSD with this board. 
Oh, and as I was talking about motherboard sizes and form factors earlier, it's worth noting this is a micro ATX form factor board, but it's a rather small one at just 197 by 188 millimeters in size. So it's a lot less across than the permissible 244 millimeters from micro ATX form factor board. Finally, let's take a look at our memory where I've got two four gigabyte Corsair DDR4 two four hundred DIMMs, which cost me a total of £42.74 or around $59. Again, I found these difficult to get hold of. Let's just get inside one of them. Again, it's exciting opening up components and we'll get one out like this. There we are, there's one of our DIMMs all waiting to be fitted. And I'm sure some of you are thinking that uh, two four hundred megahertz memory is not the fastest available. It isn't but a 2666 megahertz is the fastest supported memory speed on our motherboard using a Celeron Pentium i3 or i5 processor. And 2400 megahertz is still a very respectable memory speed and a significant upgrade for our PC. Greetings. Our processor is now waiting to be fitted. And if we very carefully flip it over like that, you'll see that on the back, like all modern Intel processors, it doesn't have pins, it has connection pads. And specifically what we see here is a land grid array of 1200 connection pads, which is why the socket for this chip is called LGA1200. Just as an aside, note that if this was an AMD processor, it would have pins, as we can see in this comparison of the underside of an Intel and AMD CPU. Anyway, returning to our Pentium Gold, it's time to fit it in the motherboard with its central LGA1200 socket. And all we need to do is to raise this little lever like that. And we should also remove the little plastic cover, which protects the pins just under here. Get that off, there we are. And uh, this now lifts back. And we can see the 1200 pins, it's an amazing piece of precision engineering this. We now take our processor, it just drops in, lining up the little uh, arrow top corner and the two uh, little notches there and there. And then we can now just drop this back in place. It will uh, move back like this. Oh, come on, there we are, that's it. In like that, drop the lever back in. Quite a bit of force going on there. And there we are, we've mounted the processor in our motherboard. Again, as an aside, note if we were fitting an AMD processor, things are very similar indeed, with the processor's pins fitting into the socket and everything being locked into place with a little lever. Next, we're going to fit the stock Intel cooler with its uh, thermal compound pre-applied on base. And it's often easier to fit the cooler when you've got the motherboard in the case, but for better filming access, I'm doing it the other way around. And because of this, I've got the motherboard raised up on these RAM boxes because there are holes here in the motherboard through which the push pins here on the cooler have to fit. So the cooler is square. It can go in any way around we want. Any orientation is fine. But you have to be aware we've got a connector for the fan here, which goes in our case here down to the motherboard down there. So I think this is the right orientation for us. So all we have to do is to line things up nice and carefully like that, there we are. And then all we have to do, as the name implies, is to push down on the push pin. So we'll push down on this one, first of all, like that. And then holding things in place, we'll do the opposite diagonal, like that. This one here, and then this one down here. And uh, our cooler is now secured into place. And so all we now need to do is to sort out the fan connection. So I'll take the cable from up like that, and this will plug in down here for CPU fan down there. And there we are, our CPU cooler is well and truly fitted. Next, we're going to fit our memory. So if we take the first of our DDR4 DIMM modules, and we can slot it into place on the motherboard. They only go in one way around, make sure you get it the right way around, put it in like that, and uh, there we are. Clicks into place, retains at the end. And then we'll bring in the other one, Goes in obviously like this and slots in again. There we are, secured in place. And by Jingo, we've now got our motherboard fitted with its CPU, cooler and RAM. Guess what? It's now time to remove the old motherboard 
and I'm going to start by removing this USB 3 card because we don't need this with a new motherboard. It's got headers for our front USB 3 ports and also back USB 3 ports. There we are. And I'm now going to remove the power connectors. That's the 12 volt power connector and also the 24 pin power connector. A little latch release on that. Come on. There we are. And we'll now take out the SATA leads which connect our drives. Some of those didn't want to come. We've also got this connector for this case fan. That'll come out of there. We're doing fairly well now, I think. Yes, just release some of these cable ties. And now all we've got left is a front audio connector down here like that. And then the final thing is down here. I'm going to give you a closer shot of this. And these are all the jumpers for the front panel. And just before you pull these out, it's worth making sure that they're actually labeled. If I take one out, it's difficult to show you exactly what's going on. But there you are. Hopefully you can see on there it says power LED. So we're safe to take these jumpers out because they're labeled for going back again. But sometimes in some older cases, they're not labeled, in which case you'd have to take very careful note of what colors went to what markings on the motherboard. Oh, and I've missed a final connector, which is the front USB 2 port. There we are, take that one out of there. But I think everything else is disconnected. It is, so we can bring in Mr. Screwdriver and take out the motherboard screws. And here we are, the last one is coming out now. And so in theory, if I've got them all, the motherboard should be able to... No, I've missed one. I always miss one. There we are. Wasn't the last one. It was the second last one. I'm going to blame the fact I couldn't see on camera, but it's not true at all. I just missed that screw. Oh dear, don't leave a screw on your motherboard. But uh, there we are. The motherboard should now be releasable. It is. Yes, there we are. We can gently take it out of the case like that. And we've created a large new motherboard sized hole in our computer. Right, we're now ready to fit the new motherboard, but before we do, we need to remove the old motherboard's I.O. shield from the back of the case. Hopefully it comes out fairly easily, like that, there we are. And we want to put in the new one, which came with the motherboard in the motherboard box, and we fit this through from the back again like this. These are sometimes a swine, but actually that's going in quite easily. And there, there we are, that's all fitted like that. Next, I've checked that the risers in the case are in the right positions for our new motherboard. If they're not, just get a pair of pliers, take them out and reposition them as needed. And uh, it's now therefore time to uh, get the motherboard and put it in the case. The uh, moment of truth. I think we have to go in like that because we've got all these drives fitted but we can go round like that, and then we just need to slot it carefully into place, making sure we fit through the I.O. shield at the back like that. That is pretty good. And we can now put in the screws. And uh, there we are with everything nicely tightened up. The motherboard has now been fitted in the case. Well, that said, there are uh, quite a few cables to connect. So let's start with the, the power supply. We've got here the 24 pin connector, which will go down here. So let's put that in down there, like that. And next, we need to attend to the ATX 12 volt connector, which on this motherboard, like on most modern motherboards, we can see here is an eight pin connector. But the connector from our power supply for the 12 volt extra connector is a four pin connector, as you can see. And this isn't a problem because we're using a fairly low power processor here, but if you had a very high power processor, you would need to use all eight pins. But you can use a four pin connector into the eight pin ATX 12 volt connector, and it only goes in one way around. You can't get it wrong. It goes in here where everything lines up, and there we are. That fits perfectly well indeed. Moving along, we come to the front panel connectors, which are hidden behind the Time 16 PCIe slot and a little tricky to work out given how the motherboard is labelled. So it's useful to confirm the pinout in the manual. So let's plug in the power LED, the power switch, 
the drive LED, and finally the reset switch, noting that the positive connection in each case is the one which isn't white. Next, we'll hook up the front USB 2 and USB 3 ports, the connectors for which only go in one way around, as well as the case fan connector next to the CPU fan. And then lastly for now, it's the turn of the front HD audio connector. I say lastly for now because I've yet to connect any of our drives with the SATA cables here down to the SATA ports on the corner of the motherboard and I'm going to leave the drives disconnected and the side off the case until we've done a test boot. Well, I've now connected a monitor, rodent and keyboard as well as applying the Intel sticker to the case to maximise the chance of everything working. So, let's turn on the power. This is the very first power-up for this computer. Always a bit nerve-wracking, but things seem to be working. We can hear fans, little light on the keyboard, the screens pick something up. Yes, it's booted. And of course it's booted to the BIOS because we haven't got any drives connected, so it can't launch an operating system. But it does seem, from what we can see here, everything is working okay. It's therefore now time to hook up our drives where I've used one of the new SATA leads for the SSD and to put the side back on the case. My strong suggestion at this point is then to reinstall Windows or another operating system. And if you want to know how to install Windows 10, it's covered in my video, Ryzen Budget PC number three, Windows install and tests. This said, it is possible that Windows 10 will boot up and sort itself out from the existing Windows installation on the PC's SSD. And so I'm going to give that a try and hopefully run a few performance tests. Guess what? We're now running Windows 10 on our PC with its brand new Pentium Gold processor. And just to let you know, I did have to do a clean install and Windows 10 is no longer activated. However, this is not a problem as in the next video, we're going to be installing Linux. This said, I did just want to boot into Windows 10, which is uh, where we are right now working nice and uh, fluidly because I wanted to run Passmark, which I've done down here, where you can see the overall score is a 3050, which is not bad. It means this PC is above average. And this compares to an overall score of 452 before we made any changes to this old PC and an overall score of 487 before the motherboard processor and RAM upgrade we've implemented in this video. I've also run Crystal Disk Mark on the SSD on this computer, the C drive we're booting from, where as you can see, speeds have more than doubled compared to the PC before the upgrade as the drive is no longer constrained by the previous SATA 2 interface. So we're benefiting here from having a more modern motherboard as well as a better processor. And I look forward to testing out the new hardware more extensively in the next video. So there we are. Our old desktop PC now boasts a modern motherboard and processor. I could of course have fitted higher specification components, but for a lot of computing purposes, what I've used are perfectly sufficient. And indeed, in the last video in this series, I intend to put a Linux distro on the machine and a lot of free software, and to show you all the things it's possible to do on a Pentium Gold PC, including video editing. I'll be editing the video on the Pentium Gold PC. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Uh -oh.